how not to be a footnote to Western artistry. I would like to offer a glimpse into my practice as a cultural theorist whose work pivots around the writing of art history against the grain of received knowledge. I have often despaired of the art historical tendency in India to remain content with merely writing citations, glosses, or explicatory notes to the hegemonic Euro-American art historical accounts. Most of the time, we are unable to ambush the main body of the text to rebut the canons and insert fresh arguments into fossilized ways of thinking and writing. Could this be attributed to the persistence of a colonized mindset that beleaguers the post-colonial subjectivity? Could there be a material basis to our diffidence given the asymmetry of inst institutional influence? Museums, publishing, journals, universities, which remain strongly skewed in favor of the old global metropoles. We rely on a Euro-American conceptual toolkit and vocabulary that claim universal applicability. We use these to gloss our own experiences in the global south, even when they do not work or require extensive recalibration. Whether in relation to installation art, public art, or new media art, even as we protest against the Western prejudices in relation to non-Western art expressed through notions such as time lag, belatedness, we also seem to acquiesce in them. I will address this paradox in the course of my presentation. I came of age during the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. My transitional generation has some understanding of what it means to experience the predicament of a double consciousness, which the Philippine novelist and nationalist Jose Rizal called El Demonio de las Comparaciones, translated as the specter of comparisons by Benedict Anderson. When Rizal's young mestizo hero returns to Manila after long residence in Europe, he realizes that he's in the grip of a mysterious vertigo. He cannot look at Manila's gardens as themselves, they are layered over with the images of such gardens in Berlin. In turn, he can't look at Berlin without thinking of Manila. Everything is seen through a double consciousness that is simultaneously present and absent, proximate and distant, constantly shifting the focal length of its optic. This optic sidesteps the binaries of native, alien, colonizer, colonized, it replaces all these notions, these binaries, with a series of spectral fluctuating claims to ontological definition. To Rizal's model of doubleness, I would add Dipesh Chakrabarti's strate strategy of provincializing Europe. Chakrabarti shows how Europe ceases to be a remote and forbidding center and instead has been domesticated within the life world of the global south. Taking this further, we see how Europe can be recontextualized within the Global South's alternative cosmopolitanism, situated with, within transcontinental circulations rather than revered as a unique historical entity. From such a perspective, we, we see in European culture formative and constitutive traces of otherness that are not often visible to conventionally educated Europeans. What if I ask how uniquely, European, how uniquely European really is the Enlightenment? To some of us, it is manifestly the continuation of debates over the rival claims of reason and faith that were first proposed in the Islamic world. These debates were proposed by thinkers such as Ibn Sina, Avicenna, Ibn Rushd, Averroes, and Al-Ghazali, al Ghazel. And these ideas actually travel to Europe via Al-Andalus. The Rizalian optic of doubleness can be debilitating or advantageous depending on how the viewing subjectivity processes it. Chakrabarti's trope and the rereadings it sustains demonstrate that we can shuffle among cultural locations, retaining an intense commitment to several versions of them instead of to only one. 
Today, we map our location on a trans-regional lattice of shifting nodes representing intense occasions of collegiality, temporary convocations, and transcultural collaborations. The traditional center-periphery model has been challenged by a model where individuals and communities are connected by surprising webs of information and unexpected alliances across borders. We're looking at a garland of off-centers. At this point, it would be legitimate to ask whether I have jumped the gun. Where does the embrace of the transcultural condition leave the project of retrieving regional histories? In fact, a transcultural perspective saves us from naive nativism and enables us to see regional histories in the amplified complexity of their historical relationships across borders and distances. We're able to see, the nar and see and narrate these histories of the off-centers under the sign of what Sarat Maharaj has described as entanglements. The trope of entanglements allows us to examine the braided destinies that knot together selves accustomed to regarding one another as polar, polar opposites. It lays bare the ideological basis of all fixed entities, conjoins them in sometimes disconcerting but always epiphanic mutuality. It liberates us to work out new forms of dialogue, dialogue and interaction across difference, a new and redeeming solidarity. This itinerary, traversing Rizal, Chakrabarti, and Sarat Maharaj, deeply informs my intellectual practice, which lies outside the boundary lines of institutionalized disciplines. I prefer to regard the practice of cultural theory as a field rather than as a discipline. A field is a dynamic fluid zone that allows for the provisional interplay of knowledge. Unlike a discipline which ultimately only sees what its norms, methodologies, and institutional limits allow it to see. To these points of reference, I would add Gramsci, who wrote, and I quote him, the starting point of critical elaboration is the consciousness of what one really is. And knowing thyself is a product of the historical process to date, which has deposited in you an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. And therefore, and this is very important, Gramsci says, it is imperative at the outset to compile such an inventory. This artisanal building of a transhistorical and transcultural narrative uh, of a transcultural inventory is crucial for me. Through a continuous relay of the intuitive and the cognitive, our plural cultural resources must consist consistently be brought to the light of consciousness and thus into the active process of self-making. This brings me to the core of my practice, an insistence on the agential subjectivity. Whether it is my work on the prehistory of new media art, the lost histories of the biennial culture from the global south, the unacknowledged roles of world fairs and exhibition design in Indian art, or bringing visibility to subaltern art practices, the notion of asserting one's agency against the politics of institutionalized narratives is extremely important to me. I shall now move into some of my research and theoretical preoccupations, which in turn have fed into my curatorial work. The consensual art historical account with regards to the emergence of new media art in India in the 1990s has been attributed to two factors. First one being economic liberalization, which ushered in new technologies, video, 24 hour television, the internet. And secondly, at the same time, an increasingly aggressive tendency within the Hindu majoritarian political formation posed a major challenge to India's liberal and inclusive public sphere. Against this reactive interpretation of new media art, I have argued for a more affirmative genealogy or prehistory for Indian contemporary video art practices. I have charted this prehistory to the collaborative endeavors, experimental films, and photographic experiments made during the late 60s, early 70s by artists such as Akbar Padamsi, Nalini Malani, Tayab Betta, M.F. Hussain, and Krishan Khanna. During the 60s and 70s, when these experiments were being conducted, the art system in India was fixated on painting as the premier form. 
So these experiments were seen as aberrations if they were noticed at all. Art criticism was still obsessed with the questions of modernism, indigenism, indigenism, uh, indigenism and um, authenticity, and had not expanded to be able to embrace such experiments. There was no critical frame framework or cultural context for them. That is why I have analyzed the history of new media art in India as a passage from no context media from the late 60s to new context media of the 90s. Akbar Padamsi's experimental film, Sizigi, Sizigi, made in the late 1960s, is one such example of no context media. The Indian art world was not ready to receive a work of this nature. In the black and white film animation, uh, he, re he reflected on the notion of coupling of two things that might be alike or opposed. The film epitomized the dialectical tension between sensuousness and austerity, revelation and reason, mathematics and mysticism, which are the abiding concerns of his art. Padamsi has explained the contradictory gestures by which he programmed the drawings, which were animated for the film. And I quote him, programming implies two movements, extensive and intensive. Intensive, as in towards the center. Extensive, away from the center. The intensive phase is towards ultimate density. The extensive phase is towards ultimate invisibility. Close quote. Radically conceptualist, Sizigi treated film as a setting for a thought experiment. Whatever little writing does exist on this film takes its cue from the artist's own preoccupation with Sanskrit grammar and aesthetics and Paul Clay's pedagogical diagrams. As against this, I have produced a transcultural reading of Padamsi's film experiment. I, start, I began to research this work uh, in the 2000s, and then I, uh, as I was looking at the work uh, more carefully, uh, I realized that we could actually read this work um, you know, um, uh, against the backdrop of um, the experiments that were created in the 19th, by the 1960s counterculture in the fields of art, architecture, and music. And uh, when I started looking at his film animation, um, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking of Bella Bartok's works, which are scored from Fibonacci, uh, Fibonacci sequence. And also I was thinking of concrete music, John Cage, Stockhausen, and that architect uh, musician, um, Yanis uh, Zenikis, all of whom played between chance and program, the aleatory throw of the dice and the pattern of a formula. And um, it's on probing Padamsi uh, further, uh, when I shared, uh, you know, I mean, uh, my thoughts with him about, you know, my transcultural reading, uh, he actually did corroborate, uh, you know, uh, uh, my, my findings by saying that he, he was actually reading at that time Cage's writings, that he was acquainted with Zanakis's work, and in the 60s he had even seen Cage and Robert Rauschenberg perform in Bombay. I'm sorry, I just need to check the amount of time I have. So it's, I only have four minutes, okay. So I have a lot more to share, but I think I'm just going to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna skip a lot of this and just uh, move to one of my recent projects, um, which is a book on the artist uh, Navjot Altaf. So here is the artist Navjot Altaf, and um, I've called my book The 13th Place, Positionality as Critique in the Art of Navjot Altaf. It came out in 2016. And, um, uh, and of course, I've been writing for the last 20 years, but this book was very special for me because uh, you, can, you could look at this book as an intersection uh, of uh, both our intellectual biographies. Of course, uh, Navjot was born in 1949, um, and I mean, uh, you know, there's a generational gap between us. But the thing is that when I went to college in the late late 80s, it, it, I mean, coincidentally, Navjot and I were reading the same books. And the reason for this is also the publishing history, because Kali, the feminist publishing house in India, uh, and OUP, the Oxford University Press, were bringing out books on issues of gender gender and ecology, gender and law, gender and colonialism. So, I mean, although we belong to two different generations and at that time we didn't know each other, we were reading 
uh, similar literature. And, and then when I finally met her, uh, we, 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 we began to discuss um, our shared readings. And, and when, when I made this book, uh, when I wrote it, I even made it in a sense because I co-designed it with the artist. Uh, it, you can see both our intellectual biographies, two, uh, an artist and an art historian, a theorist, both, both our biographies being reflected in the book. And because we co-designed it, uh, we, uh, we, what we did was we also put a lot of the book covers in the book along with uh, you know, generous spreads uh, of the artist's work. And those book covers are a way of, you know, I mean, they, they are a way of acknowledging all the intellectuals, the activists, both within India and elsewhere who have influenced our intellectual practice. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, I mean, women writing in India would be there in our book uh, by Susie Tharu and K. Lalita, an extremely important anthology. Uh, and also Lucy Lippard's The Pink Glass Swan, and many other books, you know, uh, by, uh, books by Susan Lacey, Lucy Lippard, Griselda Pollock, and, 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 and many others. So uh, the, the thing is that uh, with this book, I was able to bring all my preoccupations um, uh, in, you know, I mean, related to Marxism as well as feminism and collaborative practices together. And uh, now Jodh's practice began in the in in uh, you know I mean in the early 70s when she was part of the student uh, movement called uh, the Progressive Youth Movement, which was called Prayom, and it was um, uh, affiliated to the far left. And uh, this was the time when uh, Navjot and her artist husband, Altaf, uh, would actually go out into the streets and, um, uh, and they would uh, be plastering the streets with uh, their posters. Uh, this is a poster, an anti-Vietnam poster. This was in the early 70s. It's self-explicatory. I don't need to explain this to you. And uh, these were the kinds of posters that they would, they would, they would, they would be putting them up, uh, you know, I mean, uh, late in the night all over the city. And, um, uh, and, and also, uh, she, uh, you know, they, they, would, uh, they would actually de deploy strategies such that art could be brought closer to the wider public. And uh, they would be showing their paintings and drawings uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in hospitals, mobile crashes, outside factory uh, gates. And um, uh, of course, um, uh, on the one hand, it was intellectually uh, ex exhilarating for, for Navjot and um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Altaf, her artist husband, as well as other activists uh, and scholars. But on the other hand, of course, because uh, you know, uh, as we all know, um, those who are affiliated to party politics can be extremely authoritarian. And um, uh, some of the members, uh, uh, you know, I mean, realized that uh, there was no place for aesthetics, uh, you know, in the progressive youth uh, movement and its deliberations, because in the end, art only had to serve the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, uh, the cause of propaganda. So, so, so already Navjot uh, had started, um, uh, you know, I mean, feeling a sense of conflict about uh, how to make uh, art, which is not merely propagandist. Uh, and at the same time, make art that can have a political impact. And um, as uh, from uh, from uh, after the 70s, and I mean, uh, you know, also because of the emergency, uh, the, the the progressive youth, youth movement slowly fa uh, phased out uh, because people were put into jail. The activists had uh, you know had to go underground and so forth. But uh, in in the 80s, uh, Navjot was reflecting on questions of gender because she felt that Marxism had no place for gender. It was completely dominated by class issues. And that's when she starts reading also Lucy Lippard and Griselda Pollock and others. And what is really important and what she felt that she really learned from the Western theorists is that because at that time there, was, uh, uh, there wasn't art criticism written from a feminist perspective within the Indian context. And, um, and, and she felt that what she, what she was able to learn learn from these theorists and also uh, feminist artists like Judy Chicago, Annie Lebowitz, Suzanne Lacey, was that the discursive is as important as the making of art. And therefore, she, underst she understood the importance of performance, workshopping, uh, and, and also uh, rewriting uh, art history, uh, you know, uh, fashioning a new art historical syllabus uh, from a gendered perspective. And, um, It was during her feminist phase that uh, you know she was working out this whole contradiction between the, archi the figuration of ar the archetypal mother goddess 
and uh, the feminist literature that she was reading. So on the one hand, of course, you, you know, you could say that, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 uh, the archetypal mother goddess in a way uh, is symbolic of a certain kind of essentialism versus uh, what you have in the background, which is uh, the, these are Xerox rolls of feminist literature, which had come out in the, uh, in the 80s. And uh, people could actually just pull the string and open the scroll and start reading the literature. And she was, she was trying to work out these two, uh, you know, I mean, uh, sort of overlapping and yet conflicting trajectories in her work. Of course, uh, uh, you know, art critics like Lucy Lippard, for instance, have said that one, one does not need uh, to feel too conscious about the, uh, about the essentialism of, uh, the, uh, of the archetypal mother goddess sim symbolism, because as she says, that the, the nurturing aspect of the mother goddess is something that actually you can use uh, you know, in a productive manner. Uh, you know, for your own uh, feminist philosophy. And, uh, and as she said, that it was actually women, uh, you know, I mean, because of this quality of being, uh, of being nurturing and more hospitable, that they were able to be on, on the forefronts of all the protests, whether they were anti-Vietnam, anti-Reagan, and so forth. So, I mean, I'm also sort of, you know, I mean, uh, bringing in a lot of the debates that I actually, uh, in a way, expose through the pages of my book. And... Um, I just spoke about uh, the feminist literature that intersects uh, within the book. And this is the dialogue center uh, built by, uh, which was in the process of being built by Navjot, Rajkumar, um, Shantibai, and the other villagers of Kondagaon in Bastar. Uh, it so happened that in the late 1990s, uh, Navjot went to Bastar, uh, and um, she, uh, she, was, she, uh, she had embarked on a collaboration program which was funded by the IFA. And uh, at that time, she was exploring the notion of collaboration itself because, she, because there was no ready-made uh, discourse on the subject. And um, they decided to start you know, I mean, creating a center for themselves. So there were studio spaces, a space also for discussion. This is Shantibai taking a class at the Dialogue Center. And um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is that I think that Navjot and her uh, colleagues, Rajkumar, Shantibai, and others, were able to insert into the rural landscape of Bastar um, devolutionary um, in infrastructure. I would say devolutionary infrastructure of dissent. And let me sort of unpack that. Um, I talk about how, for example, when we look at Navjot's practice, rather than looking at, looking at it as you know, an artist citizen who's empowering those who are socially disadvantaged, I would actually deploy the trope of devolution. Because when we talk of empowerment, it means that you, know, you are the artist donor who is actually uh, re you know, I mean, sort of spreading your leprous hand of condescension towards those who are lacking in something. And when you are giving of yourself, you do not change in the process. But when I talk about devolutionary aesthetics, it means that the artist citizen uh, you know, devolves some of her privileges, some of her skills, some of her, uh, you know, I mean, some of her, imagine, uh, of some of her uh, you know, imagination and her ideas, and shares it with her colleagues. And when she's sharing that with her colleagues, there is mutual transformation. It's not just one person who's being transformed in the process. And through this mutual transformation, uh, both are aware that this will be an unmapped field of praxis, that uh, equality is not a given, that there will be conflicts, and that you would have to negotiate through those conflicts to arrive at a position. And um, this is one of the pillar goodies of the playhouses in Buster. It's again a collaborative project by Navjot and her colleagues. And uh, I went there one afternoon all by myself, and it was a beautiful, uh, sunny afternoon, and um, I, it, everybody was in, indoors, they were sleeping, and I just started counting the number of seats in this playhouse. And uh, you know, when I reached the 12th seat, uh, I realized that there was a dip, that you know, it wasn't aligned, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, the seat wasn't aligned with the others in the row. And uh, this uh, 13th seat, or what I call the 13th place, became a metaphor uh, which guided my book. And that's why I called it the 13th place, because the 13th seat is the place of potential. It's the place for imagination. It's also the place for dissent. You can be, uh, you know, you, you can actually be part of the collective, but you can be slightly apart. You have the right to dissent when you disagree with things. And uh, this became a kind of magical trope for me, and I call my book the 13th place. 
And this is one of the, the playhouses in Buster. And this is based on a design by nine-year-old Somnath during one of the workshops. And towards the left, you can actually see the, the, the design that he's proposed for, for the playhouse. And what's really interesting, uh, I will just take one more minute and that's it. So, so what's really interesting is that actually uh, the, the columns ex uh, extrude from this, uh, from this structure and they, they are not load-bearing columns, but they become columns on which you can play and the roof becomes a percussive roof. And I'm just going to now end on, the, on, the, uh, on one of the dialogues that we had at the center. Um, when I started asking Rajkumar and Shanti Bai, how did they look at the notion of collaboration? Uh, uh, they first began by saying that, of course, they had to, they were forced to use the English word collaboration uh, and uh, when they went for the IFA meetings, who were their funders. But then later on, they, they started using the Hindi word kala sayog because there is no word uh, in Hindi for collaboration. So it, that would be art, artistic cooperation. But then when I pushed Rajkumar further and said, but that is actually the language of uh, the bureaucracy and the government. So then he came up with uh, another term called baitya, and baitya is actually uh, a customary exchange. So that if you know if your roof is leaking, then everybody comes together from the neighborhood and you know helps you to rebuild your roof, and then you have a feast. But uh, I further probed him and I said, but yes, this still does not explain your experimental practice today because that's about a customary exchange, and that's when he came up with the term akal bata bati, or the sharing and exchange of intelligence, and. Uh, I, I, I have to acknowledge uh, Rajkumar's agential subjectivity. Uh, this, this, this model of collaboration, of exchanging and sharing of intelligence is given dominance in my book. And what's really important is that, I mean, of course, we can actually go through this whole trajectory of Nicolas Burio, relational aesthetics, Grant Kester, Mivon Kwan, and others. But I wanted to also customize the act of collaboration and see what that, you know, as I said, not just be a footnote to Western art history, but to create our own knowledge. And, and, and that knowledge will be created from the conflicts that exist within our own elitist art world. Um, so I think uh, with, on that note, I will say thank you. Thank you for your generosity. I know I have uh, stepped over my time. Thank you very much.